Let's talk about creating geometry in the most basic sense in Form Z. What you see here on the screen is a series of four objects with four additional copies of each one. We're going to go through some various tools to create different types of objects. I'm just using these as an underlay to snap to. Most oftentimes you're not going to have geometry to snap to underneath. In this case, I'm doing it just to keep this exercise nice and tidy and visually pleasing while we go through it. A couple things to note about this particular model file is I have the axes and the reference plane both turned off, again, just for visual simplicity. Let's talk about some of the basic tools in Form Z to start generating geometry. We've got the Shapes palette, which we're going to tear off. We've got the Draw palette, which we're going to tear off. And we've got the Generate palette, which we're also going to tear off. We can see in these palettes, there's many different basic two-dimensional shapes, which include rectangles, circles, and ellipses. You'll notice that there's different inputs required for each one of these. So where this circle is determined by a center and a radius, this circle is determined by an edge and a diameter. So there are different ways to generate your geometry. Depending on what you need, you might choose a different tool to do so. In the draw category, we've got lines, vector lines, and then we've got several spline types and then arcs. And again, with the different types of arcs, you've got an arc where you can see here the first click would be in the middle, the second click would be the start, the third click would be the end. If I jump over here to arc three, you can see that the first click would be the beginning of the arc, the second is the end of the arc, and the third click would determine the center point of that arc. So again, depending on what you need, you're going to choose a different tool to accomplish your task. Under the generate set of tools, we have what you would consider primitives. And across the top row here, we've got cube, cone, cylinders, spheres, torus, etc. We also have some more complex objects to choose from here in the bottom row. We're not going through all of these. We're just going to do some basic exercises here. But these are the main tools that you might want to start with when you're generating objects. So we're going to start with the rectangle tool. And anytime you're beginning to draw objects, one thing that you really want to pay attention to in Form Z is the Tool Options palette over here in the Palette Dock. So if you don't see your Tool Options, you want to go under the Palettes, scroll down, make sure that Tool Options has a check next to it. Usually shows up right here. And in the Tool Options, when we're drawing a new type of object, we're going to get different options that show up depending on which tool we click on. So with the rectangle tool, we can create a two-dimensional surface, a two-dimensional wall, a 3D extrusion, a 3D converged object, a 3D wall object, and we can place holes into objects using the shape that we've determined with the tool that we've selected. So what I'm going to do here first is I'm just going to simply click on my first rectangle and generate a 2D surface. Now I'm going to click on the next tool, which is 2D wall, and you'll notice now when I click on 2D wall that we have a justification option and a wall width option. So you can modify those before, during, or after you generate your object. So I'm just going to leave those settings as they are. And again, click from left to right to generate a 2D wall object. And if I zoom in there, you can see that it actually has a hole in that one. Let's go to the next one, which is a 3D extrusion. And the option here is to determine the height. So right now there's a check next to dynamic. What that means is when I click, I can dynamically set the height of that object. So whatever you want the height to be, I can either visually click a number and we can see as we pull up, we get a little height pop up that's telling us the height. We can also look up here in the height field and see that we can either type a number in or we get a readout of what that number is. And again, this is all because we have dynamic checked. If I uncheck dynamic and I type in a number like 10 feet, you can see it jumps to 10 feet tall. And if I hit enter, it's going to commit that object. The next up is 3D converge. So again, doing the same set of steps here, I'm going to click on these two points on my underlay and we get a converged prism. You can see that when we're drawing a converged object, we have parameters for height, length, and width. So again, you can graphically determine those as you're modeling, or you can set these numbers before, during, or after the creation of that object. Lastly, we have a 3D wall type object. And again, I'm just going to leave the numbers right where they are and draw this. And we can see that this one, in fact, has walls that outline the shape of that rectangular object. So here are the five typologies of shapes, from 2D all the way to 3D wall, 
with several steps in between. Let's now switch over to the Circle 1 tool and do the same thing on this next set. So I'm going to go over to my tool options and click again on the 2D surface. And right now I have center snap turned on. So I'm actually snapping to the center of my underlay object that I created. And I'm just going to drag out a two-dimensional surface of a circle. Let's go ahead and switch to the 2D wall and do the same thing here. We can see what that looks like. Let's go with the 3D object. This time we have the height already set. It remembers the same setting as we used last time. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Go to 3D converged. And I'm going to go to 3D wall. And you can see that same object types, just different geometry this time. Next up is the Polygon tool. So let's go down here. Again, we're going to go to our tool options and select 2D surface. We're going to pull that out and snap to a point. I'm gonna switch over to the 2D wall, do it again, and you get the idea. Now, one thing that you'll notice about the Polygon tool, even though it's showing a hexagon and I was drawing a hexagon for that, over here there are the number of segments and you can switch that to any of these presets or you can put in any number that you like. Also, the Polygon drawing here, instead of having multiple Polygon tools, it's actually handled in this pull-down menu. So by default, it's set to center and radius, just like the circle tool was that we chose. And there are other options here as well. And there are additional patterns that you can apply to each edge. So let's go off to the side here and generate a hexagon that is a 2D surface with a sawtooth pattern enabled. And first it's gonna let me draw the normal hexagon, but then once I click a second time, it allows me actually to determine the depth of each one of those teeth around the edge. So it's applying those to each side equally. So it could be a very acute star in this hexagon shape, or I could go out and make it of more of an obtuse shape if I wanted to select a different angle. All right, the last shape that we're going to explore in this exercise is with the vector line tool. So again, with the 2D surface, this is just going to draw 2D line work. Now, when you're drawing two-dimensional line work, you can keep clicking and it will just continue to go. I'm going to undo back to where I ended my underlay. And there are two keyboard shortcuts that you want to know about when it comes to this. You can tap the E key to end or you can tap the C key to close. So ending it will end it right there, and if I tap the C key, it'll bring it back to the origination point, which will actually give me a surface. That's not what I'm going for right now, so I'm not gonna tap the C key. I'm gonna tap the E key to end that vector line at the end of my underlay. So this is a 2D surface version, which is actually just an open curve of a vector line. Now I'm going to switch to the 2D wall tool, and again, just leaving the default settings in the tool options, I'm going to trace that same path, and again, I'm going to hit the E key to end my vector line, and you can see now this 2D wall tool has the 5.5 inch thickness, which was set in the tool options. Next up is 3D extrusion. Again, the height is already determined at 10 feet. And again, I'm going to hit the E key to end, and we can see that this is two polygons, which in Form Z are called faces, and there is no thickness to these. So that is a 3D extrusion of a two-dimensional line. Next up is the 3D converged, and this is going to make something kind of interesting. I'm going to click again on my main points down here to trace my object, and you can see how immediately just drawing two points, it's already converging at the top. And when I pull that over to my third point, it's actually picking a convergence point at the top that is kind of an average between those things. So again, I'm gonna click on that next point and I could continue to go, or in my case, I'm gonna hit the E key to end that. All right, and lastly, we're going to click on the 3D wall tool. We already know what this is gonna do. It's going to generate actual walls. And again, I'm gonna hit the E key to end that and just zoom in on that so we can see that there's actual thickness to that object that we just drew. Now, every time I've drawn an object, you'll notice that there are these yellow handles. 
Those handles show up during the creation of an object in what is called the object buffer. So again, if I just draw a shape, we get that object buffer. These are the parameters. Remember earlier I said you can modify these before, during, or after the creation of an object. So let's do that here with an object like this. So after the creation of an object, we can actually click on those handles and drag them to a new location. So if I wanted to stretch the box in this direction, and you'll notice that we maintain the wall thickness the entire time, even though we're stretching this object to have a new boundary. We can also dynamically adjust the height to something new as well. Now we can also snap to existing objects with that height. So for instance, if I hover over this object over here, it's gonna automatically assign the height to match that object because we're using inference snapping, which we also covered in the earlier video regarding snapping. This also works for midpoints. So if I wanted to snap to the midpoint of this wall over here, now this object is five feet tall. Now, I mentioned that we could also modify objects during creation, so let's do that now. I'm gonna go ahead and draw a new object off to the right here. And during the creation of this object, as I'm clicking my second point to really lock in the overall footprint of this walled object, I can now change the justification to the left, and I could also change the wall width. So let's go with something a little more obvious here. Let's go with two feet and hit enter. And now the wall thickness is quite a bit bigger. So you can modify these before, during, or after an object's creation, as long as you don't heavily modify that object after the fact and heavily have some asterisks after it. There are some objects that can handle modification and there are some objects that can't handle very much modification. And so your mileage may vary. It just takes some experimentation. I want to hone in here on one more parametric option. And I'm going to show you on this 2D wall object. So when we select objects after they've been created, those handles do not show up by default. And so what I'm going to do here is show you how to turn those handles on for objects. And then we're going to look at some of the special controls with the circular object. So how we turn the parametric controls on for objects is you can either right click on the object and you can go into show controls or you can click on the inspector palette and you can look at the bottom here where it says show control. So under selection, info, it doesn't matter which tab you're on at the top, you'll see this show controls button down here. If we click on that, those controls will show up. Now the interesting thing about showing controls after the object has been made is that those controls are now on until you turn them off. So if I click over here on this object, you can see the controls are still on for that object and I can show controls for that one. Let's click on this one, show controls. Let's go over to this one and show controls for all of these. So now the controls are shown for all of these objects. Let's just take a look at what the controls allow us to do on cylindrical type of objects. So I'm gonna zoom in here and click on the wall width tool. And you can see that I can actually determine a new wall width. And I'm snapping to the grid down here so you can see why that's jumping so much. If I turn that grid snap off, we can get a much more fluid wall width. Uh, I wanted to click on the start angle and what this does is it allow us to actually peel this shape open and we can adjust how much angle this actually covers. So we've got a beginning and an end and we can adjust those independently of each other. That works for the 2D versions. It also works for the 3D versions. It also works for the 3D wall versions. And it does different things to each one of these object types. So I wanted to show that because I think it's pretty interesting. It's not something that's apparent as you're building those objects, but when you turn on controls after the fact, you can make some additional adjustments. Like I said a minute ago, controls are now showing for all of these objects, and if we wanna turn them off, we can turn them off one by one by clicking on the hide controls button, or we can use the pick tool to select multiple objects. I'm gonna drag a window around these objects, and I'm just gonna hide controls with one click for all of them at the same time. Sometimes if you have those controls showing, it gets visually cluttered. So you definitely want to know how to turn those on and off. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to get notified when new videos are released on this channel, click the subscribe button below and click the notification bell icon to get a notification when new videos are released. See you in the next one.